All right, so physical security, or a more apt title, which is a whirlwind overview of a ton of physical con security concepts, tools, and basically whatever I find cool. Because there's a lot that goes into physical security as a whole. There's a lot of stuff that some people have heard about, people have no idea exists. It's just, you know, this miasma of a bunch of wonderful information, and so I put a bunch of really cool things in here with the uh, general idea being get some people interested in it because why not? So the hope is at some point in this uh, overview of a bunch of stuff, you'll find something that is worth going and Googling in your free time at some point. So anyway, who am I? I'm Jack Potter. Those websites have content I create. It's not very good content. I advise against going to them. Uh, my qualifications to talk about this include being at the front of the room while you are not at the front of the room. Thus, you must listen to me talk to you. Uh, also, I've been like reading every blog post and book and watching every conference talk about physical security. I could get my hands on for like seven years. So no formal qualification of any kind, but just like a bunch of weird ideas in my head that are just enough to be dangerous. So today, like I said, a really rapid fire coverage of a bunch of cool stuff, uh, trying to get people to find something that they find interesting. Um, yeah, that was more or less the limit to get in here. And if you know me at all, this shouldn't surprise you that this is not very organized. Uh, it just kind of jumps all over the place. Most of the information and almost every image that you're going to see comes from this man, Deviant Alum. Almost all the rest come from the open organization of lock pickers to wonderful, well, person and a wonderful organization to get acquainted with online if you want to learn more about anything that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, but first, legal disclaimer don't do anything stupid because, like, this is really cool stuff. Like, you know, interesting, fun, super cool. But breaking into buildings or offices or anything at all without permission is usually illegal, usually immoral. Never, not, it's just not super cool, so don't do it. Uh, like all other IISG presentations, these are just tools, concepts, ideas. It's up to you to be adults and not ruin it for everybody. So by staying in the room, you agree to not mess things up for me or for IISG as a whole. If you intend to leave, please do so now. Thank you very much. Uh, so right off the bat, uh, I like legal stuff and I like maps. So I'm going to show this map of lockpick legality because that's something that people ask about a lot. Um, I like to carry around a set of lockpicks and play with a practice lock in my free time. And I've had to answer to people who ask if that's illegal. Uh, fact is, Iowa has a statute in our criminal code saying that burglary tools or lockpicks are explicitly legal. Uh, they're only illegal to possess if the state can prove that you have intent to use them to commit a crime. And because myself and other physical security and lock sport enthusiasts carry them uh, for you know the, the hobby and the sport of it and not for criminal activities, uh, it's totally legal. If you want to look it up, it's chapter 713 of the Iowa Code, subsection 7, the, literally the only state of Iowa law that I have memorized. Um, funnily enough, Nevada is in yellow, where picks are legal, but further caution is merited. They have this kind of weird thing where picks are kind of seen as intent to commit a crime, but not really, and the laws are just never enforced because that's where DEF CON and Black Hat and B-Sides Vegas and stuff have the biggest lock picking you know, organizations in the world. So that's kind of funny. Also, this isn't some like arcane hidden knowledge. If you type this into your search engine of choice, uh, as of yesterday, there were over 480 million results for this search. So, the like when I talk about picking locks, that's not some kind of secret, and none is the n n like all of this content that you're about to hear is stuff you can find pretty easily with you know any any search engine. So. Uh, two more legal COAs. I, I realize I have a lot of these in here. Uh, only pick locks that you own or have explicit permission to pick. Uh, that kind of goes without saying. Don't go breaking into your neighbor's house. Uh, and do not pick locks that you rely on, because especially if you, even if you're good at picking locks, but especially if you're not good at it, you really don't want to break a pick off inside a lock or break something inside a lock and then have to explain to your parents or your landlord or anybody why there are now bits of broken lock pick inside their lock. Or even you, go, you don't have to go and you know, find a locksmith and have your lock replaced because you broke it. So, you know, be an adult. 
yeah, your dorm room. Just don't don't do that. Like locks are super cheap at Walmart. Go buy some and play with those. So we're just going to get right into uh, how does picking locks work? Because that's that's fun. This is what a lock looks like if you're looking at it from the front. I think I've got my pointer thing here. Cool. So uh, what we're going to look at here, we've got the cylinder where all the, the fun stuff happens. There's pins inside, and there's the keyway that keys go into. You cut away a little further, and you see that these pins are actually stacks of pins uh, with a spring on top. Basic idea is that if you can lift this pin here so that the uh, gap between the pins lines up with the line between the cylinder and the lock body, called the shear line, uh, the cylinder can rotate, the lock can be opened. Typically, uh, when the lock is you know, locked, it can't rotate because that pin is blocking it. But when you lift it up with a key, you know, it, it goes. Now, obviously, a single pin doesn't do you any good at all, uh, which is why most locks have five. Uh, residential locks, the standard is five pins. Commercial locks, the standard is six. You can find them with a lot more. I think actually in Freddie Court, the keys have, for the uh, apartment doors, the outside apartment doors are seven pins, and then the bedrooms inside are five. Um, you know, there's a, a mix of it. Your apartment might have five or six pin locks, at least five, hopefully. Uh, so, and you'll notice the, the, uh, the line in between the pins is at different heights on all of them. Uh, this is very much by design. That's, you know, you look at your key and see how it's cut at different heights. That's more or less the idea. Doesn't do you a whole lot of good if someone could just, you know, push a popsicle stick in and push them all up to the same height and open it. <coughs> so, yep, key goes in. Deviant Olive made all of these gifts, by the way, which are now like the gold standard of showing how lock internals work. So, why reinvent the wheel? But yeah, uh, key goes in. Pins go to the right height, lock can be opened. This is what the top of a lock looks like, and this is, uh, or the top of a lock cylinder, and this is why we're able to pick locks. I'm going to flash back and forth between a couple pictures here, and you're going to see a, a subtle change. This is what a lock cylinder should look like. This is what they do look like. That's actually really subtle. I don't know if you can see that from the back row, but uh, you'll notice that the, uh, here's an example of this on a real lock. These holes are machined you know, in uh, large scale you know, mass production facilities where precision is like, kind of achievable, but uh, these holes are drilled slightly off of each other, just offset by a, a tiny bit. You know, we're talking fractions of a centimeter, or fractions of a millimeter, possibly. Um, but you see the, the drilling isn't super consistent. And because they're slightly offset from each other, uh, that enables somebody to open the lock one pin at a time. The basic idea is that you take a tool that uh, can manipulate one of those pins individually, and you go through, and this GIF has decided to start playing halfway through. That's wonderful. Uh, you apply tension with a tension wrench. You can see at the bottom, it's a slight twisting force on the lock. And then take your pick, go through, and push upwards on stacks of pins. Because one of those holes is going to be just slightly, say, all the, uh, slightly further to the left than all the rest of the uh, stacks of pins, if you can get that one lined up while twisting clockwise, then uh, you know the, the pins will catch there. The lock will ro the cylinder will rotate just ever so slightly, and it'll hold that uh, that pin in place. And you know that stack has been picked. Uh, you just repeat that process, pushing them up one at a time, finding which pins bind, and you go through the lock, and the lock is then opened. So you know, say you're a physical security consultant. You've been hired to go break into some building, find your way into their server room, steal a bunch of client information or something. You're thinking you're going to go pick all the locks in the building. That's not what you're going to do. You're going to bypass all the locks in the building. This is, gonna, this is my awkward transition from picking locks to bypassing them, because I, we could talk about picking locks for another couple months. Uh, we're just going to jump into the idea of bypassing locks, because picking locks takes effort. Uh, say you find this in an office building. Look at that. File cabinet with information is locked. Look at that. You can take the drawer out of the file cabinet, and now the lock doesn't do a whole lot. That's much faster than picking the lock, and that's a really bad lock. Like wafer locks, you can open with like a nail file, and you just you take the drawer out. Uh, so why do people do that? Because picking locks takes time, practice, and special tools. You can't you know, sit outside the server room playing at it for five minutes without somebody eventually saying, hey, what are you doing? Stop doing that. Uh, meanwhile, you know, if you can bypass the locks, you can get in fast. It's easy. The tools that you need, you probably honestly already have. Um, yeah, this fun video posted to the uh, lock picking subreddit. Uh, so here's a tool that you can use to bypass a door, a hammer and a nail. Uh, if you've ever seen a door, uh, a door hinge, or more accurately, if you've ever installed or removed a door from a door frame, 
you know that the only thing that holds that hinge together is a single pin that you know, runs uh, down the length of the hinge. You place either a nail or one of these fancy tools underneath it, smack it with a hammer, pin pops right out, and now you can just take the door right off the hinges. There's nothing holding it together. So you can have a $10,000 lock on the door, but if I can see the hinges and I have access to a hammer, it's meaningless. You can just uh, pop it right off, which this is something that happens in the field all the time. This is a classic uh, you know, red team physical security assessment technique. If the hinges to the secure room are facing the insecure side, door's coming off. So how do you prevent that? Here's something fun, security hinges. They're not actually all that expensive. Uh, it's regular hinges, but they have a peg on one side, a hole on the other. When the door is closed, peg goes in the hole. Can't pull the hinge off because there's something physically blocking it. Right here, you see uh, jam screws, which allow you to convert literally any door into a door with security hinges, which is actually kind of cool. You take your hinges, take out those middle screws, replace them with the uh, jam pins, or the jam screws. Now you have the pe uh, pegs on two sides, holes opposite, and your door is now a security. Your door now has security hinges, so when it's locked, even if I can see the hinges, I can't just pull it right off. So, you know, if you happen to go into work and walk into the server room and see that you aren't using those and the hinges are on the insecure side, maybe suggest to the facilities people that you know maybe this is a worthwhile three dollar investment to keep the server room much more secure. Yeah, we're just going to jump straight into something else that's related to locks because transitions are hard. Uh, these are the latches that hold doors shut. Uh, you'll notice that there's a difference between these two. This one is flat right here. This one has this little D-shaped nub coming out uh, right there. You've probably seen those on a door. You might have played around with them before and wondered, you know, what's the little thing there do? Uh, come on, slides. There we go. This highlighted bit right here is referred to as a dead latch. What it does is uh, it renders the latch dead when it is pushed in. Basic idea is if that little nub piece is pushed into the mechanism there, that latch can't be manipulated at all. Go home, try it on your door, you know, just push the little piece in, then try and push the, uh, the big part of the latch in. It gets locked up, can't go any further. Uh, and what that does is prevents people from slipping something in between the door and the door frame and just manually uh, pushing the latch in without unlocking the door. The reason this works is because the strike plates that these latches go into are frequently either not lined up correctly or they are too large. Uh, the reason for that is a lot of contractors will actually only stock the largest size strike plate that they can get their hands on because they're installing lots of different kinds of latches. And why would you want to keep track of the inventory of 80 different kinds of strike plates when you can keep track of the one largest one that fits any door? Um, thing is that renders the dead latch useless because the strike plate is no longer pushing in on the dead latch. The latch can be easily manipulated. Also, if the door isn't fit properly, if there's, I mean, this needs to be pushed all the way in. If there's, you know, a half centimeter of extra room there, uh, yeah, the dead latch does nothing and the door can just be slipped open. So here's a demo of how easy that is using, actually, a wonderful little tool. You've ever, anybody ever seen someone use a credit card to open a door? That's a pretty classic thing. Um, so Sparrows is a wonderful lock pick and just lock company. They sell this fun little device called the Hall Pass. It is a credit card, but it's made of stainless steel, and it does this. Uh, you walk up to doors. Come on. This worked earlier. You can do it. Wonderful. Walk up to doors, door is locked, take this, push it into the latch, door is now open. This works because the dead latch there uh, just does not work at all. The door isn't fit properly, so you can just push this in and uh, walk right in. Same thing works with a credit card, of course, uh, or in this case, I just used an insurance card, but door is locked, plastic slides through. I mean, that looks like the door was never even latched shut, but I swear it actually was. It's faster to open that particular door with one of these than it is with the key. Um, Works from the opposite side, too. If you can see the strike plate, these tools have little hooks on them. Uh, idea is pretty simple. Just, you know, obviously this case doesn't make any sense because I have access to the lock, but, you know, slip the hook in behind the latch, pop it out, and uh, it just pulls everything right out. So, you know, if you have one of those on your door, play around with it a little bit. Make sure that the dead latch is actually being engaged because a lot of people either 
A, have a door that is installed poorly and it does nothing, or B, actually don't understand what that does. They'll pull their door shut and then give it an extra little tug, hear a second click and think, okay, now the latch is actually engaged, when in reality they've just defeated one of the better uh, little security uh, devices that's built into just about every door uh, sold today. Speaking of awkward transitions, we're going to talk about electronic locks. So anybody know what this is? Proxmark 3 RDV4. It's a fun little tool that is sold. Uh, you can get them all over the internet for $300-ish, $400 if you want to get some extra antennas with it. Um, these are a wonderful toy for sniffing RFID tags and then using and then uh, playing that stuff back, writing it to other tags. What do we do with that? We take these little prox cards that people use to get into and out of buildings and secure facilities and copy those. So anybody ever seen, I think it's season one of Mr. Robot, they sit in a coffee shop, they like get somebody, somebody walks by, they sniff the ID badge, let themselves into the facility. I think that happened. Somebody please nod so I know I'm not making that up. Cool, thank you. Um, that's very much a real thing. Like that's not Hollywood made up. Like if you just have a passive RFID, you know, prox card, uh, you can, like, people can just sniff that and play it back. The Proxmark is really nice because it can either just, you know, take the, uh, copy this card and just play it back on its own or write it to uh, other blank cards that you can buy. So, you know, just print up your own card, make it look all fancy, write somebody else's credentials to it, and now not only do you have, you know, an access card dangling off your belt that makes you look like you're supposed to be there, it actually lets you into rooms in the building. So that's kind of fun. Uh, these guys uh, work with the core group. They do physical red teaming stuff. They took one of those big uh, scanners that you'd have outside a building that someone just kind of waves their wallet in the general vicinity of, and it will read it and open the doors. Took one of those and weaponized it with a Raspberry Pi, its own power source, slip it in a laptop bag, and it can read, I believe they said, up to about 18 inches away. So you don't even need to walk right up next to someone. They have videos demoing it where they just sit down on a park bench next to employees of whatever company they've been hired to test the security of and sit down for two two seconds they get the card you know walk away and now they have access to whatever that employee had access to so you know uh, a lot of high security facilities nowadays will not rely exclusively on one uh, RFID badge to get in uh, to secure areas. I think uh, Linus Tech Tips actually has a fun video where they go to drive savers and show how they do everything there, but because they're working with really confidential data, they actually uh, talk about how in order to get into secure rooms, they need to use both the RFID badge and then a PIN, a uh, PIN number for, so they have uh, two forms of authentication. Here's something that's kind of fun, and there's even like a transition built in because it has a, a prox card reader right there. But we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the rest of this box. This is a door king box. These things are seen all over the world. Uh, they're pretty frequently put just outside gates in uh, gated communities, outside apartment buildings, outside office buildings. You know, it's a wonderful device that allows people to, uh, you know, open a gate or a door and you know waltz right in. Uh, the general idea is that you're supposed to have either the appropriate badge, the appropriate PIN number, uh, or the you know security for the facility might have an override key for it. Or if you have none of those, they have a call button down there that you can use to you know summon assistance to let you into the building. But something that's really interesting about these is that uh, this. Uh, well, this lock right here is for an override key. When those are installed, they're usually replaced with a really high-quality lock cylinder that, you know, not everybody in the facility is supposed to have access to the key. It's, you know, something, it's a guarded secret. They make sure that, you know, because it, it just opens the gate automatically. That's not something you want getting out to the world, so they, they replace that. This lock that opens the whole box up doesn't get replaced. You can replace it, but a lot of places don't. They just leave it stock, which is unfortunate because literally every single one of these things leaves the factory with the same key to open the box up. Now, this is where things get really Hollywood. Uh, we open this up, we have some, you know, we've got the circuit board, we've got all of these wires all over the place. Uh, if we zoom in here, we see a bunch of terminals right here. And you know, you might be thinking, that's cool, but you know, electricity is scary. And I agree with you. I've taken one circuits class, and it's terrifying. And I don't know what any of that does. There is a PDF that explains literally all of this on the Door King website. Just go look up the Door King user manual, service manual, whatever. It's the first result. You see right here, they call out these uh, relays 
uh, the relay terminals. If we look at that, the relay one common, relay one normally open. You bridge those two with a little wire loop, a paper clip, whatever, and it triggers the relay, which usually just fires the solenoid, opens the gate, opens the door, disengages the locks, you know, lets you into the building. That is not something that you want just anybody on the street walking by to be able to do, and yet, you know, it's very doable. Also, this little button is worth pointing out. Uh, I'm going to go back here real quick. It's right here. You might put together that its location on the box is uh, very close to where that override key goes. Uh, override key, just uh, the, the lock cylinder just rotates that lever, which pushes that button, which just fires all the relays that the box is connected to at once, which opens all the doors the box is connected to at once. So you don't even need a wire loop. You open this up, you push the black button, close it back up, and the door is now open. Uh, which, if you don't believe me, because you probably shouldn't, this is a wonderful video that Deviant Allen put out explaining it. Uh, in the video he's narrating, I don't know, do we have, I, I kind of messed with sound earlier. A little override key, that's going to be useful if you're delivering packages. We don't care about that key. We care about the fact that every door king is a 16 key. So you're going to get a momentary switch on that tailpiece, and that'll help you out. So that's not ideal, to put it lightly. Now, to be fair, this isn't some high security facility. This is just a gate at an apartment complex. He says in the script he's visiting his friend or something. And if you wanted to get by this, you don't need to open the box. If you look at the top of this here, there's this big open gap in the wrought iron. You get a branch or something, reach through and push the handle from the other side. Like, this is not, you know, the NSA. But still, it's kind of funny that you can just open the box and let yourself in. And those are pretty prevalent. And he mentioned the uh, Door King 16120 key. Surely that's something that only security professionals and Door King maintenance people and maybe the facilities managers for these facilities would own. Turns out, you type 16120 key into your search engine of choice, you can buy them for $13. Just have them shipped right to your house like you know, next week. Um, yeah, it turns out uh, this Gatehouse website, they have a lot of cool keys on there. If you're ever bored and feel like just building up a key ring of various keys that you probably don't actually need but could lead to hijinks, uh, the Door King 16120 is an interesting place to start. On the topic of electronic locks and uh, easy to defeat electronic locks, anybody know what a REX sensor is? Mean anything to anybody? Request to exit sensor? You frequently see these inside uh, the external doors of buildings, usually uh, inside uh, server rooms and stuff right above the door. Idea is that they just use passive infrared, look for whoever's, or look for somebody near the door, and if someone's near the door, door unlocks so that, you know, the server technician doesn't have to go dig a badge or a key or something out of their pocket and unlock the door, it'll just open up for them. Unfortunately, uh, because it's passive infrared, um, that is much louder than I wanted it to be. And the audio on this actually isn't very important. Um, there's a rec sensor right above the door. Uh, it just looks for some sort of temperature differential. If it sees you know, multiple temperatures in front of the door, it opens. If you look really closely right about here, you're going to see that the tip of a canned air straw gets pushed through. And uh, when the trigger is pulled on that, it just throws a cloud of cold. Is the video actually playing? Yeah, there we go. Uh, just blows some cold air in, and the rec sensor triggers, and the door opens. That is also not ideal. Uh, that's something that a lot of, you know, th this shows up in a lot of um, like red team Twitter accounts and blogs in general. You know, just here's some security tips for your building. Don't have those functioning, you know, after hours or something. Uh, because, you know, that, that's all it takes. Uh, and just because it's funny, I included this. Um, Another Deviant Alum classic, somebody with his core group, they're on a job, they have this door that they want to get through. This man is outside with nothing but his nice little vape pen. And because the cloud that he blows out is hotter than the air surrounding, that is all it takes. Well, it takes two puffs, apparently. But after another, doors open. So, rec sensors, wonderful, convenient things. There's some places where fire code might say that you should have them so that if you know, people are running toward a door, it'll open. Um, but as a general rule, maybe try and make sure those don't function after hours or something when there isn't someone watching the door and you know, making sure that people aren't just vaping through it. 
Oh, and then, I, yeah, this is also just because it's hilarious. Um, you can do the same thing with whiskey. Uh, he, Deviant Alum, walking down the street, finds a bank. I don't condone this, by the way. I, don't, I have no idea if he's supposed to be breaking into this bank. But he has a shot of whiskey. It just blows a mist through the doors, and that trips the sensor. These things are really sensitive to any sort of temperature differential, and you just, just it's not good. I know that there's you know, some efforts make better ones that rely on um, radar stuff or just something to at least attempt to identify that it's a humanoid shape moving towards the door. But come on, like this is, this is a problem. Uh, even less organized stuff, if you thought this was organized before, then here we go. If the clicker wants to work. OK, here's a fun one. Who would win? We have an expensive electronic lock. It has a deadbolt, reinforced strike plate, security hinges on the door. The drop ceiling tile boy. Uh, turns out a lot of places that have drop ceilings, like uh, is that, yeah, kind of the stuff in the room uh, where tiles are just dropped down onto this grid, uh, the walls in those buildings don't actually go up to you know, the, the floor below. So that's something that you see a lot of if you read some you know, red team debriefs of uh, physical security assessments, is that the server room has you know, these, this really nice door, these walls all surrounding it. But if you move a single tile out of the way in the drop ceiling, you can just climb up, cl walk over the wall, and drop back down, or crawl over the wall, I suppose, and then drop back down on the other side. Uh, I've been in a lot of offices where that is, in fact, the, play the case, because Nobody ever thinks, hey, this needs to be you know, a secured server room. This is just built as a closet right now, and we're going to make it a networking closet, and we'll deal with you know, security later. Because security as an afterthought would never happen anywhere, right? Um, yeah, so drop ceilings. That's potential for a lot of fun. This is a tangent that I just wanted to include because I like talking about it to everybody, and I have a captive audience right now. Anybody recognize this kind of lock right here? Anybody? Anybody recognize? This little red diamond symbol, know what that means? That is a TSA-approved safe skies lock. You can get these at Walmart or probably at an airport or something. General idea is that they are tiny locks that you can use to lock up your luggage. And then the TSA has master keys that they can use to open the locks, inspect your luggage if necessary, and then lock it back up so that there's no chance that a rogue baggage handler or just some other traveler in the airport could open your suitcase and steal valuables. Turns out everyone with GitHub and a 3D printer has that master key too. There's six master keys that exist. Uh, there was a project to reverse engineer them, which if you look it up, it's hilarious. They reverse engineered the locks by hitting them with hammers and then just kind of picking through the components and figuring out how, how it works. But all of these have a little keyway underneath. And if you print out this ring of six TSA keys, you can just open any TSA approved luggage lock. So, you know, don't rely on those, I suppose, for security. Also, if anyone ever tells you that government mandated backdoors and encryption are like fine because no one's going to reverse engineer it and put it up on GitHub, send them this link. Uh, garage doors, here's something fun. This applies to both residential garage doors and then garage doors you might find on a loading bay or the backside of a building somewhere. Uh, Sammy Kamkar, wonderful, wonderful hacker who has produced some wonderful, interesting. Uh, just a whole lot of weird stuff. He's a, if you remember the MySpace days, he wrote the Sammy is my friend worm that took down MySpace inadvertently. And he's just, he's a character. He had a project called Open Sesame that he presented, I want to say at DEF CON 23. Uh, if you go to his website, which I highly recommend doing, is a 10 minute video where he walks through this whole thing, explains it, and it's uh, a, a very cool, very cool idea. Uh, we don't have 10 minutes to watch it, so I'm going to give the low quality summary. Basically, uh, there's a little toy that Mattel put out years ago called the IM Me. It was a little keyboard with a screen. General idea was that uh, you would buy two of them, uh, give you know one to your child, one to their friend or something, and they can type messages into it, and then it just transmits them back and forth, and they can sit in the back of the fourth grade classroom sending each other secret messages. It turns out uh, these things are actually powered by a pretty powerful uh, sub gigahertz system on a chip. It could, trans it could transmit it at any frequency under a gigahertz. It was only supposed to go on a couple, but people quickly realized, hey, you can do a lot with this stuff. And what's really fun about it is that if you take the battery cover off, there's a couple little uh, test pads visible that you can just you know, solder some wires to. And turns out those are all you need access to if you want to flash new firmware to the chip. So Sammy Kamkar took this 
uh, wrote some fun code using, um, okay, Christ, what is it? The, uh, the De Bruin sequence. Uh, it's a cool mathematical concept that I think Dan talked about at his vehicle pin pad brute forcing. De Bruin sequence, Dan, yeah, 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 cool, okay, yeah, that's what I thought he talked about. Um, I don't understand, the math is cool, I'm not going to try and explain it right now, but basically, uh, this little kid's toy could brute force any gr residential garage door and most commercial garage doors open in 11 seconds. So, that's bad. Uh, a lot of manufacturers have moved from what they were doing, which was literally just a 12-bit passcode, which is not at all secure. Like, for reference, two ASCII characters is more secure than that. Um, but uh, yeah, there's still a lot of old garage door openers that are out there, and this is something that you know security teams know about now and will uh, take advantage of. This is the most Hollywood thing I'm going to talk about probably ever. Like, this is the coolest thing uh, in this presentation. Uh, look up the DEF CON 23 Van Albert and Banks looping surveillance cameras through live editing. Basically, uh, what they did, they took a security camera that's you know, wired back to a security office somewhere, found the Ethernet cable, cut it open, un uh, you know, untwisted the twisted pairs. They built a very cool passive tap, which uh, it, when they explain the, the hurdles they had to go through to make this work, it blow, it'll blow you away. But basically, they found a way to splice into this cable without disrupting it. They can capture UDP traffic using, they actually had to write their own network stack in Python to get this to work. It's like this whole weird black magic that shouldn't exist. Um, but they capture traffic for a bit, manipulate the traffic so that people won't realize they're being fed a loop, and then rebroadcast it. And basically, you know, just listen to these image, or the images coming in from the security camera and create just a you know, five second loop of nothing happening and then uh, keep broadcasting that. So they demoed it by having a little safe up on stage with a camera pointed at it. And you know, they splice into the wire. And they're able to go open the safe, and you know, while the, the live feed is just showing, nothing happening. So that's really cool. I can't do it justice. I highly recommend going out and finding it. I know this is like only very tangentially related to physical security as a whole, but cameras count, so that goes in here. Uh, so I, what is this? I've talked for like 30 minutes, and I know that this this like barely covers anything at all. Like this is just some cool stuff that I highly recommend you go research some more of because there is, like I said, a whole world of cool things to learn here. If you want to learn more, deviating.net, Deviant Alum is a wonderful gentleman who, puts, who puts all of his presentations, all of his slides, all of the videos, everything he makes in the public domain. So you can go to, or eh, maybe not public domain, it might just be Creative Commons license. You know what, look at his website. It'll, it has all the stuff he's ever done. Uh, either way, it's cool. Uh, I highly recommend these talks I'll Let Myself In, Tactics of Physical Penetration Testers, Key Decoding, and The Search for the Perfect Door. Uh, that's three hours of your life that are well spent watching those. Uh, those are all on YouTube as well as, well as his website. Uh, Will Alsop has a wonderful book called Unauthorized Access. Uh, this is a book that I've had for years and just absolutely love. He goes really into the weeds of how to set up enterprise grade physical security environments, talks about cameras and motion sensors and doors and how this all needs to play together. I believe, I, I looked this up just a little bit ago, I believe that book is available on Safari Books Online through the Iowa State Library. So if you want to read that for free and you know morally you can look that up. Otherwise I'm sure you can find a copy you know, in a legal and moral way. Uh, there's a wonderful, uh, I keep saying wonderful, I feel like that's my, that's the crutch word that I'm leaning on here. Uh, DEF CON 18, Physical Security, You're Doing It Wrong by Delchi. It is a great talk where he gets into how, you know, he, when he uh, worked for a company that was building a new office, he was very involved in the entire process of building up the physical security plan from the ground up. And he just walks you through, if you're ever in that situation, what you do to make sure that your company has you know, a good physical security plan in place. Uh, if you go on, if you're active on Twitter, those are the four people that you need to be following: Deviant Alum because he posts all his stuff there, and then Snow, Jack Hyde, and Jason E. Street are all physical security assessors who do various red team jobs. But they tend to either live tweet things as they're doing them, so like they'll actually tweet, "Hey, currently hiding in an elevator for the next two hours. You know, ask me some questions about this job I'm on," or you know, they'll post complete write-ups as to how they broke into secure facilities after the fact, which are always a good time to read. Um, get on Google, DuckDuckGo, YouTube, whatever. 
Uh, look for physical security talks from various conferences because there's a lot of them. Uh, the tool website, or talk to Arden if he's here at IISG or SecDSM. He's our local, the head of the local tool chapter, and he can talk to you about locks and you know the mechanics of locks and manipulating the mechanics of locks for hours on end. Highly recommend it. It's a good time. Uh, if you get on Reddit, there's a lock picking subreddit that's wonderful. There's also a physical security subreddit that's kind of dead, but every now and then good stuff gets posted. And that's actually everything that I had put together for this. Any questions about anything at all? Yes? Uh, so what, have you ever had a time on like, uh, when you were trying to pick a lock and it broke inside of the lock? I have not. Uh, so if anybody didn't hear, the question was, have I ever broken a pick off inside a lock? I have not. One of my coworkers, who also really likes to pick locks and shall remain nameless, has, which is like a, a whole mess. Fortunately, it was just like one of these cheap acrylic practice locks. It didn't matter at all. And one thing that's really nice is if you buy a set of picks, like the Southern PXS 14, I'm not sponsored, but this is a wonderful set of picks. Also, if Southern wants to sponsor me, that'd be great. Um, they come with a broken key extractor, which is just like a, a kind of sharp barb on the end of a uh, stick that you can use to reach in and fish broken bits out of the lock. Um, so luckily, you know, he, he just broke a piece off. It wasn't anything crazy. The lock was still functional. We were able to clean it up and use it, but um, you know, that's not the kind of thing you want to have happen if you're if you've been hired to say break into a building to assess their security plan. That's that's bad. Anything else? Oh. Do you know of any common attacks that go against locks that require a key fob? I actually, so do I know any common attacks against locks that require a key fob? I don't actually have any off the top of my head. I promise you that if you Google DEF CON key fob attack, there's going to be something out there. Um, if they're doing just, re it depends on you know, how, how complex uh, what they're trying to do with the key fob is, but I'd imagine that'd be a little bit trickier than just you know the passive RFID of a prox card badge or something like that. But So no, I do not. Anything? Yes? Do you have anything that you recommend to like, secure yourself personally? Yeah, so uh, anything I'd recommend to secure yourself personally. Uh, like I talked about earlier, the uh, if you're worried about it, it, so let me back up. Before you get started with anything like that, uh, one thing that's a, you know, a good idea is to sit down and write out what your exact threat model is. I mean, if you're just worried about someone breaking into your apartment, that's different than if you are you know, a reporter who is worried about you know, someone trying to you know, prevent you from publishing a story, which is different from you, know, you being a government agent, which is, you know, there's, you have to figure out what your biggest threat model, what your threat model is and what you're trying to defend against. Uh, if you're just wor worried about you know, someone surreptitiously breaking into your apartment and you know, stealing something there, then the biggest things are, in my opinion, you know, having the security hinges is real nice. I, I like that idea. Uh, having a decent lock is something that you know, is, you know, it, it's well worth, uh, well worth doing. If you talk to Arden, he can, at SecDSM, uh, he has some great insight on what the best balance between you know, consumer grade, affordable, and really, really hard to pick locks are. Uh, there's you know, also all kinds of great lists for that kind of thing online. Um, but uh, like as, a, as a general rule, I think one thing that I always find funny, uh, both for physical security and just you know, privacy stuff as a whole, people like to post things online that they really shouldn't. And the number of people who have posted, hey, I just got a house today, or hey, I just moved into a new apartment, and take a picture in front of it with their keys, is way too high. Uh, if I have a picture, Deviant Alum has a talk on this. If you have a picture of somebody's keys, it is, at this point, it's trivial to uh, reconstruct that, either cutting a key yourself or 3D printing it, or just, you know, it gives you some insight of how, you, how you're going to pick the lock if you weren't going to remake the key. Um, but yeah, just don't go, don't be the person who shares like, hey, here's a picture of my my house keys, my driver's license, and the pin to my garage on Twitter. Like that's. That's my number one biggest, like, I'm sure nobody in this room would ever dream of doing such a thing, but, you know, be smart. All right, if that's everything, then I know Cole wants to announce something. I also know Nick has a wonderful gift that he wants to share of a dog with everybody, so if you go talk to him about that, uh, he can do that, or, you know, you know what? It's really cute you know what, here, there. Oh, no, 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 that's the wrong window.
there we go. There, Nick insisted that I do this. He tried to put it into my presentation before I started talking. You know, you're welcome. He's good physical security of his laptop. You know what? <laughs> I don't need to justify myself to you. Anyway, that's all I've got. If you want to talk about picking locks or you know bypassing locks entirely or want more recommendations for conference talks or something to look at, uh, talk to me after the meeting, hit me up on Slack, whatever. I have no shortage of you know fun recommendations for that kind of thing. That being said, that's all I've got. So thank you for listening to my ramblings. And yeah, cool. You want to...